Hi, and welcome to the Homeopathy Health Show. I am Atik Amadbati, a fourth-generation homeopath with over 20 years of professional experience in this field of healing. In the Homeopathy Health Show, I'll be talking all things homeopathy and natural, with guest interviews, tips and advice, and answering some of your questions. Homeopathy is truly a unique, complementary system of healing suitable for all ages, young and old. I'd love to hear from you and welcome your questions on homeopathy and how it can or has helped you. Feel free to email me at health at liketreatslike.co.uk or visit www.liketreatslike.co.uk for more information. Once you're there, take a look at the Knowledge Academy and Blog section where you will find interesting information. Both sections are growing day by day, so always check back. So let's begin today's show on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio, real feel-good radio. My guest on today's Homeopathy Health podcast is Elaine Watson from the School of Homeopathy here in the UK. Now, Elaine has been in practice since 1994 and teaches medical science at the school. She was a research scientist in marine biology and microbiology. She studied homeopathy at the British School of Homeopathy and graduated in the mid-90s, as well as having three children, two dogs, several cats and ducks along the way. Now, Elaine's been teaching medical sciences at the BSH since 1993 and has also taught at the Welsh School and been a tutor for the School of Health since 1995. She works in South Wales and Copenhagen and has had some rewarding experiences working with the children of Chernobyl. Recently, Elaine wrote two new courses, Anatomy and Physiology for Homeopaths and Pathology and Disease for Homeopaths, which she really hopes will enthuse and inspire the homeopaths of the future with the wonders of the human body and allow them to integrate fully their homeopathic knowledge with medical science. Elaine Watson, it's uh, I'm delighted to have you on today's podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello, Atik. It's, it's good to be here. We've got a lot to talk about, so um, yeah. <laughs> let's uh, uh, <laughs> yes. l- l- let the let the podcast begin, as they say. Indeed. Um, now, something I ask everyone who comes on the show um, mm. is how they got into homeopathy. So, uh, how has your journey been? What uh, what uh, what did you find of interest that led you to this path of healing? I think, in common with many people, it just suddenly happened. And I really don't actually know why and how. But if I if I think about it, I've always been interested in plants and herbs and gardening and animals and also art and music. Um, so perhaps the foundation was there already. And I did study zoology so and botany at university. So. I've got sort of a bit of a knowledge of classification and stuff and Latin names. But the the sort of lightning bolt moment came when I was actually at a coffee break uh, where I was working in, in Cambridge in the labs. And a student came in who'd just been to a homeopath for a consultation and she just told us all about it. And also mentioned that she was doing an evening class in homeopathy and so for some unknown reason to myself, really, I rushed upstairs and booked myself on the evening class. Um, and even when I went to the class, I had not a clue what they were talking about, but somehow it just was very compulsive. So I did that and I did that probably for about three years because we all loved it so much. Um, and then I realized that it sort of matched my love of science and art and creativity so it just seemed like, yeah, this is a good thing to do. That's a, that's a that's a very nice story, and uh, it also matches um, many others as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had experiences where some homeopaths have said that it's a result of um, by accident they were told to use a certain remedy by a friend of a friend or a friend, and yeah. and that led them the interest because obviously they they found the remedy worked, and it, you know it a light bulb mo- a light bulb moment happens, doesn't it? It's strange, um, yeah. There, it, there are many, many paths into homeopathy. 
But uh, yours is certainly very interesting because of the whole thing about plants and herbs. Um, Agri-homeopathy is becoming more and more yes. popular. It's yes. growing. It's uh, it's about 10 years old now, isn't it, approximately? Yes. Yeah. But uh, still um, early stages. Yes. But I know that it's um, doing great things um, for yeah. for the soil, for plants. And uh, yeah. I think certainly it's the right time, isn't it, at this moment? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, it. It's so wonderful to see how a remedy can affect a whole coffee plantation or, well, yeah, anything that's growing in your garden or or just sort out any kind of pest. I love it. I really, really love it. And I'm so happy that that it's becoming really popular. And I think it's one of the subjects of the Society of Homeopaths conference coming up, actually, isn't it, in April this mm. year. So, yeah. And it, I mean, it... My whole thing about homeopathy is that it doesn't do any harm to the environment. That to me is more important than many, many things. And so how wonderful that you can treat plants and crops and actually not put toxins into the soil and the air and the river and the waterways. And yeah. Yeah. The other thing about homeopathy is just as you were saying that, um, is it sustainable? It's so eco climate friendly. It's unbelievable, isn't it? If you cannot get hold of sugar, for example, as a form factor or a, or a lactose powder, water is sufficient. Yes. yes. Um, it's just amazing, isn't it? Yes. It's so, yes. it's, it's, it's so, um, cost effective that it's yes. unbelievable, yes. actually. It, it, it is unbelievable. And it, and it's really sad that people just go, often think it doesn't work and they don't have any experience of it they don't give it a chance they think it you know it's impossible people say to me I can't believe Elaine you know you're a scientist and a homeopath how can that possibly be and it's just like you don't understand you really don't understand but yeah for me the one of the most important things is definitely do no damage walk lightly on this earth so yeah you know as you said that (laughs) I thought of one foot in the grave and Victor (laughs) Meldrew I don't believe it, you know. I don't believe it. Well, actually, okay. that's been that's been my go-to through this quite cold and wet uh, winter. I've been watching all those episodes and just laughing so much. I don't think I watched them at the time, and I yeah, I just don't believe it. They are so funny, aren't they? I Genuine, you know. This is the comedy, isn't it? That's yes, real comedy. I love it, and I feel like just at the moment we do need a bit of a good laugh. Yeah, because there's an awful lot of bleakness out there. So yes. <laughs> Those were the days, eh? Norman Wisdom, you know, you were yeah. growing up. I remember. I know we're going totally off tangent here, but off hey, tangent already. Um, the thing is, I, I, I grew I up without my... a TV, so um, mm. at least I was out and about in the fields looking for flowers and stuff. So I never watched any TV. So this is all new to me. <laughs> oh, I see, which is even more exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, staying with plants and herbs, actually, um, have you? personally been involved with agri-homeopathy or treating plants um, with with remedies? Yes, yes I have. Well in fact recently I, I, I did attend Camilla's course which I found interesting but I did also find that you know let's be arrogant I knew quite a lot of it already but then I forgot or reflected on the fact that I had been a soil scientist, a microbiologist, a gardener, a great compost maker so yeah I mean, even just the other day, the cat knocked over a, um, a very lovely plant in a pot in the garden. And I thought, oh, that's the end of that then. And I, and I gave it aconite and, and, it, and it just didn't. It looked as if it hadn't had an accident. And I was, it was amazing. And it's always amazing, isn't it? That's the thing about that's... homeopathy. It feels like we should get used to it being amazing, but we don't, which is wonderful because it is amazing. Well, homeopaths that have grown up with homeopathy for yourself and so many others for every homeopath, actually, it's, uh, it becomes a a no brainer. Um, You have an injury, you have a a fever, a flu, you have earache, whatever it is. It's just reach for the, the, the box, get the right remedy if it's appropriate and it works and it's done. And there's no stress and there's no fear and there's no health emergency, unless of course, God forbid, it's something serious, of course, but for everyday acute, uh, you know, run of the mill type symptoms, which we're all yeah. prone to, and we're all going to uh, yeah. have experienced anyway. It's it's a no brainer. It makes healthcare so much more easier, so much so much more personal healthcare. I mean, so yes. much more responsible, and and yes. and it's just great. 
and and enabling, I think. And so mm. I suppose the way I was convinced of homeopathy was because I you know, I was pregnant when I first went to the evening classes and then actually subsequently had three children, as, as you mentioned. And of course, my first aid kit was my go to. And they responded so amazingly well that fortunately we didn't have any middle of the night, you know, blue light, A&E emergencies. Um, and I just I feel that's one of the things that everybody could benefit from. It's just so wonderful. Yeah. Do you think, Elaine, as an experienced homeopath and as a, of course, as a, as a very qualified teacher and as a very qualified individual, that just by knowing that somebody has homeopathic remedies at home, uh, that that fear factor is removed. But as a result of that, um, it actually helps the vital force because you already know there is treatment next door in the other room, as an example. Yeah. And so when something does happen, your vital force, is it right to say your vital force is not that affected at that moment in time? Well, I yes, I, I I think so. I think if if you have a, a fairly extensive first aid kit, and you and you know maybe you know your children, you know your family, you know your animals, you know your plants even, um, it, it yeah, that is very very wonderful. And and it's individualized, of course. So it's not like oh, you go to the box because they've got a fever, and you give them belladonna. You give it with care and thought, but it's there to help you. You have so much experience and uh, I've got so much to ask you. I think we're going to be here for at least three hours, by the way. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, I wanted wrong. to move to your uh, teaching um, at the School of Homeopathy. So do tell how did that all come about and what it's <laughs> like and what you're sort of involved with as far as the, the teaching within the sphere of homeopathy. So just like my entry into studying homeopathy, I think my entry into teaching the medical science was by accident just because while I was training our own teacher left and um, I was asked to take over which, which was amazing um, so I did teach at the British school physically every month um, both in in Bristol, Bath and, and Birmingham wherever we were uh, so I had classroom teaching if you like for very many years and in and also I was a tutor for the School of Homeopathy, but that was their distance course that they did. So I had quite a lot of insight into what the problems were and how students were reacting to it. And then I wrote the courses while I was still working at the British School of Homeopathy. So I tried them out on my students, which was great because they were very honest with me. And, and that was really helpful to sort of shape them and then in a moment of sort of megalomania I offered them to Manny Norland at the School of Homeopathy um, and much to my amazement they agreed to give them a go and that was quite a long time ago now I guess and um, so we use my medical science courses as um, the home study courses and the attendance students have to do them. And every year, once a year, I go and give them a quick boot up to uh, get them activated to complete them because they're part of, you know, they're part of the necessity to for graduation. So, um, so I really enjoy teaching. But, and I think how I teach is not this is medical science and you've got to know it all. It's it's about an integrated thing with materia medica philosophy and case taking as well so that people understand and can retain the model that we have in homeopathy which is so different from allopathic medicine it must Having be a nice that, fit to have the yeah. medical sciences part and i think it's so so important anyway nowadays if if you're not aware of some of the basics then uh, it, it can become yeah. yeah the thing is that i mean i think i think it's very easy for us to get very excited about the kind of philosophy and the materia medica of homeopathy and go off on one and forget that we're actually we're actually treating people people's bodies <laughs> so, mm. so we do need to know mm -hmm. and also we do need to know the terminology in order to communicate with the medical profession because they're not going to 
you know, they're not going to come to us on the whole. We're having we're going to have to go to them and, and we don't want to make a fool of ourselves. So for all those reasons, actually, I think it's a really important part of the course. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. What do you find is um, the the? How do the students actually uh, take it? The the <laughs> the young homeopaths, uh, young not in age, but young as in uh, you know this path of homeopathy. How how do they take to this? Um, well, I would <laughs> say. But when I walk into the, you know, walk into Hawkwood, then when I'm t- teaching the attendance course, I do notice that some of the students will dive into the, the nearest cupboard or the toilets because they see me coming. Um, <laughs> I think they're probably fairly resistant uh, at the beginning because maybe they've had experience in other courses. I mean, you know, maybe in aromatherapy or chiropractic or something where it's been very medical, very dry and very difficult. So I feel like maybe I have to work quite hard to, to, to get them on board, to show them why it's so relevant and hope that they will enjoy it. And generally, after much kicking and screaming, they, the, re, the, the response is positive, I would say. I don't think Good. they're totally pretending, <laughs> <laughs> but they may be. <laughs> I think a lot of them are surprised. I think one of the things that I was really, a, apart from the fact that I wanted it to integrate into Materia Medica philosophy and and case taking. I also wanted to try and find different ways of accessing people's way of learning. So my courses have bits that you do in small bits, bits that you might have to draw, colour or research, bits that you might have to listen to, bits that you might have to recite so that you can try and access a different part of your brain to find the way in which you find it easiest to learn and my whole thing about the course is actually that both courses that you have a useful piece of documentation at the end of the course it's not like this is homework for the sake of it this is homework so that you've got something you can refer to later and you're um, you're of course you you go in um once a week several times a week or well, the course the course runs over um, eleven weekends, so it's only once a month, and I only go once a year, physically, to the first year to give them the shock of their lives, and second year <laughs> they they see me coming, and they know that they haven't done their A and P yet, and they have to do P and D as well. So yeah, mm. so you can see how popular I could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I actually this takes me on to the two new courses um, that you've actually uh, written, which is uh, anatomy and physiology and pathology and disease. And these have been specifically written for homeopaths. So uh, what makes them different to perhaps what's already out there? Well, I think, I, I think what I just explained really is that I wanted to integrate. So some integrate materia medica casework, and philosophy so that people would understand why they're actually doing the course because it's Mm. when you're seeing a patient that you don't need to go into the allopathic model we've got a very elegant um uh complementary you know we've got a very elegant holistic model and please don't throw it out of the bathwater so the course is yeah We'll explore bits of uh, um, anatomy through Materia Medica and look at maybe the affinity of some of the remedies for different organ systems or pathology. And because a lot of the teaching now in colleges is sensation based, actually, a lot of I feel a lot of this information is actually possibly not being emphasised anymore. So it's possibly a bit more useful than it might have been. Mm. Excellent. That's uh, <clears throat> excuse me. That sounds like a uh, a very valuable uh, addition to what you're already doing. And I think it's, of course, I'm, no doubt it's proving invaluable to the young homeopaths. Well, it's surprising how I mean there there are a lot of 
because because I'm the tutor for the courses too for the online courses that was something I hadn't actually anticipated but of course it's obvious isn't it that I need to market and there are students all over the world so in Australia and America and Japan in Finland in Spain in all Africa all sorts of places doing it and also not doing it in their first language um so it, so it's very wonderful that that it's that it's enabling people to come to some sort of understanding of the medical science that they need to know. Yeah. I was saying to somebody previously as well on the podcast that what you're doing is so, so important because when I actually think about this, when I take a step back uh, from, from the homeopathic world that I'm in and I see you teaching students from around the world, what you're actually doing is something quite profound because in the grand scheme of things that person let's say sitting in a remote part of the world wherever it may be learns homeopathy um you know you've 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 relayed as much as you can and then that spark that they have becomes um larger and larger and as a result of them that they become you know a really excellent homeopath who then helps so many people but then you find that you know, their children become interested in homeopathy. Mm. And then they, let's say out of two children, one says, yeah, this is for me. Yes. And then that carries on and on. And this is not just teaching homeopathy, but obviously any, any, um, anything that anyone is doing, but referring it back to homeopathy, uh, because it's to do with serving humanity, it's serving people, it's helping people, supporting them through remedies, through consultations, just by listening to them and talking to them and discussing. A lot of counselling, of course, is involved, as as every homeopath mm. knows. It's quite profound, isn't it, when you think mm. of that, that in a 100 mm. years, there may be somebody who's practising homeopathy, and it's a result of you. I, it is wonderful, really wonderful. And actually, what's happening, what's been happening recently, in, in truth, is that some of the people who've been my patients in the, you know, like 30 years ago are now studying or their children are, are studying now. So you do, you do see that, but I, and I really love that network. Um, it's, it's also feeds me because, you know, when you live on your own, in your own little bubble, it can be quite lonely. And then you turn on the computer and there's people all over the world and we're all joined up and, and we can have this communication because we have this basic understanding of what it is we're doing and why so yeah it, it's bigger than the whole really well it's, yeah it's bigger than the sum of the parts isn't it yeah bravo to you <laughs> <laughs> well who knows I mean, <laughs> it's also been i mean these the course has actually been translated into chinese which is which is incredible um and i think currently uh, is is being translated into bulgarian Oh, the, and there was a suggestion of it being in Hindi. I'm not sure, but yeah. So again, a remarkable thing. Amazing. The thing, the thing that I found absolutely uh, amazing in some respect was that it was the first translation was into Chinese, and the way I've laid the courses out is that I divided them up into six units with lots of little tiny activities that people can do because as a mother, you know, it's like oh, I haven't got time to sit down for three hours, but I can do this. Da da da. And then I discovered, so people do it very sort of bite sizey, and then occasionally there's a bigger piece of work. But I discovered to my horror that the Chinese actually teach the whole thing, and then they get all the students to come for an exam at the end of the, oh. whole, the whole course, and they have to recall everything. And um, so it's a very different teaching. That's like having A level, doing A level. <laughs> yes, isn't it? It, yes, like doing A level. <laughs> so uh, hmm. yeah, that's that's. Well, that's just interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> now, something that um, all homeopaths uh, have, of course, a, a love for helping others. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the field of homeopathy. And compassion, of course, is a very large part of that. Whether somebody admits they're a compassionate person or not, <laughs> that's that's you know that's a different uh, matter altogether. But we know, as homeopaths. Uh, we know of other homeopaths, like I can talk about you, you can talk about someone else who, who is in homeopathy, and we know compassion is a large part. But that actually leads me on because to something to do with serving humanity, uh, in your specific case with the children of Chernobyl. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I was reading up 
um, on the School of Homeopathy website, you know, about your background and so forth. And some of it is quite fascinating. And I'd really like to give you this opportunity to share that and how you got involved, what was involved, actually, mm. and what your experiences have been as a result of that. So I don't currently live in South Wales. I, I did. I've lived. I now live in, in uh, West Somerset, have been for 10 years. But when I lived in South Wales, um, there was a group locally bringing children from Chernobyl as through the Baptist church, I think it was. The, um, mm. And a homeopath who actually at the time was a student got involved in the project and needed us to come forward to offer help to these children who were brought out of Belarus for six weeks for the summer to get clean air, clean food, go to the dentist, go to the optician, go to the doctor. But also we added in homeopathy. Um, so the children were aged between, I think, I can't remember exactly, six and 11, seven and 11 or something like that. And they came over with a trans with translators um, and then they were housed in in uh, local families who, who who did everything for them. And, and it was very wonderful. And there's lots of different groups around the country still doing all that. But we uh, assembled as a group of homeopaths to take the cases of the children and see if we could help them. Because what has come out of this awful accident was that a lot of children have been affected by radioactive iodine. Um, and and have thyroid problems of one kind or another or very low immunity. And it was very obvious when the children came at the beginning that they were very underweight, they were very, very pale and quite lethargic. Um, but after we had worked the case through, through a translator, which is also remarkable, we could give them remedies and begin to see them coming into their constitutional picture, if you like, and then by the end of the six weeks, it really was marked that they had so much more energy. And then they would be sent home with remedies that we thought would be suitable for them alongside supplements and any kind of anything else, really, that, that they would require. Um, Nula Ising in Ireland had had initiated some work using granite, marble and limestone had had remarkable responses of that nature with children there so sometimes we were using those remedies to restore some kind of balance and then eventually the the, the child would emerge into a pulsatilla child or a silica child or a phosphorus child so it was extraordinary really so I I was involved with that for about five years, but then I then I moved away. They're they're still working, you know, with it. It just doesn't happen around here. And then actually, I, I was so upset too by the Fukushima situation later in Japan, um, and people were contacting saying, "Is there anything we can do?" So again, that knowledge can be transferred, and hopefully, some people in Japan are in a better state than than they were after that accident. It must have been so rewarding. Um, you know, I remember in 1994, <clears throat> during the Bosnian War, mm. I was part of a con convoy, humanitarian convoy, oh. and we drove to Hungary to a place called Nagyatad, which was a, a camp at that time for refugees of the war. And we stayed there for 10 days, and we took uh, we took a big lorry load, and we went through Germany and Austria, and, and we, ended up, we ended up uh, you know, in uh, in Nagyatad, and uh, we took food parcels. We took a large number of uh, you know clothing items, and 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 so much more. But the horrors of war, and and the fact oh. that you know the experiences I had there, where children were orphaned, and mm. all they actually wanted was someone to talk to them and to listen to them. But with your situation, because you were able to then give them homeopathic treatment as well, it's so much more rewarding because you're able to then physically help them from, mm. you know, from the emotional and, and physical point of view as far as diseases or disease is concerned, mm. disease and the trauma mm. that they've been through. 
So, yeah, it's it's so nice to to hear that, you know. It is. It yeah. I I would have so loved it if if the children had been post puberty, because I was I was always concerned that that growth spurt might actually um, trigger problems, you know, with the, again because the thyroid was involved. But mm. only just the other day, there's a Facebook page for the group in in um, in uh, South Wales, and I just happened to see a picture of two of the children that we treated, I think, in 2002. Now grown up, of course, and it was just it was exceedingly wonderful. <laughs> I can <Yeah>. imagine. <clears throat> Are you still able to keep in touch with them, or it's? I suppose when they grow up, it's difficult, isn't it? Well, yes, it is difficult. But the but the 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 group, I mean, the the wonderful group that actually organised this whole thing go over in winter and take with them support remedies, vitamins and things like that, still keep in touch with as many people as they possibly can. Um, because, of course, a lot of the children at the time were orphaned too because mm. there'd been terrible deaths, accidents, autoimmune disease, goodness knows what. So a lot of the grandparents were involved and not the parents too. So really interesting that um I, I love talking about the human side of things and, mm. and how homeopathy can come in at all stages of life and all situations in life whatever you may be suffering from and of course it, it like i say all, always it doesn't mean that's it you know it's the homeopathy or the highway not at all but i mean sensibly uh, we know that homeopathy is phenomenal and probably the best system in the world for uh, trauma for emotional and mental health conditions absolutely. yes um, and this absolutely. is where it really shines yes no absolutely i haven't ever done any of the work that well just, just like you mentioned just then going to bosnia but but again such wonderful wonderful healing of emotional crises you can't imagine really what people are going through partly mm. because my family was was young and, and i didn't feel it was appropriate really at the time to leave and to go and do that but but some of the work, you know, the AIDS work in Africa is is absolutely mind blowing as well. It's amazing, it really is. And yeah. uh, like minded people like yourself who only want to do good, and yeah. that's the thing. It's never been about. It's not, you know, for someone tuning in perhaps for the first time, homeopaths are not millionaires, and I've said this several times. Yeah, it's not about the money. It never will be. It never has yeah. been. Yeah. Um, the the founder of homeopathy was not rich. He was not well off. In fact, I think he moved over 20 times in his lifetime, even more, actually, I believe, yeah. from one place to the other. But he never left homeopathy after he discovered, uh, you know, its its healing properties and its healing potential. Mm. And he served to the best of his abilities until his last breath. So it was not about, uh, it was not uh, how much money you can make. It was how many people you can help. Mm. And that's totally different. It changes the dynamics mm. totally, doesn't it? Mm. Yes. And I think on the whole, an awful lot of homeopaths, you know, they're not on an ego trip either. Mm. Um, it's it's just about humility and, and doing the best you can with the skills that you've inherited, I guess. Yeah. It's also, um, it's going to sound perhaps a bit uh, pessimistic, but uh, <laughs> it's real. We all have to pass away. But you know, they say your life flashes before you um, when, when you're about to pass away. Um, but it, it's if you've done your best, let's say, as a homeopath, let me talk about myself because it's it's a bit easier. But I hope that when that time comes, if I've helped people and genuinely they're happy and as a result of that, you know, I've got their prayers and their gratitude, then it's nice to know that you tried your best. We can only try. We, yes. we can't you know we we can't always succeed it's but if the heart is in the right place and you truly want somebody to heal and to get better then at least dare i say it, you can die in peace uh, on yes. at least with this in mind that you tried your best yes i think that's yeah. couldn't be better really could it really we're going mm. back to one foot in the grave aren't we <laughs> there's, a, there's an underlying theme here i don't there believe is an it. underlying theme <laughs> oh, well i'm i'm scottish as well so of course there's a fat link <laughs> <laughs> oh dear now for somebody who is interested in homeopathy um to study homeopathy to take up homeopathy and not necessarily perhaps to 
become a practitioner, but just out of interest. So they have a few remedies at home and they know what to do. What's your what's your advice to them as a seasoned professional? Oh my goodness, I hate being called <laughs> a seasoned professional. <laughs> Sounds like a good piece of it's not as good as a good bottle of wine. Um yes. What would I say? I think get hold of books that might be helpful. I always recommend Miranda Castro's complete handbook of homeopathy mm. um, and maybe her mother and baby book as well to people who might be interested. I, on on the whole, I suppose the people that I might encourage would be uh, mothers with children, because that seems to be commonly where most of most people come from for homeopathy, I think. Um so if you can study something like that book, which is written so easily and then have an experience of trying to use remedies, then that's a good thing. Um, please come to any talks that we give and ask questions, ask lots of questions. Make The thing about homeopathy is it's never ending. So it's not like you, you know, you go and study, you get a piece of paper after four years and you've done it. Um, it's not like chartered accountancy exams that you've completed. So it's a lifetime's um, inquiry. There's always much, much more to learn. What else can I possibly say? I don't know. What else? No, that's that's, uh, that's very, very complete as well. <laughs> very complete. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. You know, I was going to go back to agri homeopathy because um, you spoke about, um, you know, the interest and your your personal experiences as well. Mm. Um, the soil that we everyone is talking at the moment about depleted soil. Um, the soil is uh, magnesium is is one mineral which is very deficient in soil nowadays mm. and uh, you know that can lead to a number of health issues for us what's your sort of um, take on that as far as what can be done as far as the soil is concerned the depleted soil that we because of over farming over production of course you have mm. to feed the masses and it's a catch-22 isn't it so um, it's one or the other or it's, or it's neither I always laugh about this, really, because when I left university and I went to Aberdeen to, to study soil, it was just so unsexy, whereas everybody in Aberdeen at the time was studying oil. But now, of course, I come back to it and the health of the soil is is so important. Um, but what to say? I don't know. I mean, the thing is that so cheaply, if magnesium is deficient in the soil, you can apply magnesium sulfate as a remedy in liquid mm. and and you can you know for, for a few pennies you can increase the chlorophyll in your plants or or whatever or the iron or the selenium or i mean all of it and you can also get the balance of the microbes right and wrong so easily in the same way i mean you just take the take the case of the soil or the plant showing you the symptoms of yellow leaves red leaves crinkled leaves whatever um saplings that don't thrive you know just all of it it's the same as as, as people homeopathy really so there's such a so many remedies that could be helpful just in exactly the same way understanding of of you know what, what's in the soil so you know in terms of magnesium and silica and phosphorus and nitrogen and all the rest of it and then to try and grow the things in the right place as well. Mm. One of the big problems I had when I was working in Cambridge was we were working on um, on oilseed rape to try and increase the yield. So we, we, I was working as a plant pathologist trying to reduce reduce the uh, disease. And yet there was mountains, you know, there was so much oilseed rape at the time that the yield, it was, it was irrelevant really that the yield would be so high. And, and the whole of... East Anglia was completely covered in yellow fields, which then, of course, marched across the country and more and more people got hay fever from the um, the pollen. So mm. it, yeah, 
it's 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 a tricky one isn't it um, it is agri it agricultural is. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> small size not huge don't take the hedges out look after the bees yeah yeah absolutely all of that so um elaine what's what's on the horizon what are you what are you what's uh any books coming out perhaps <gasps> no books coming you out you must write the, a book uh, well tell me there's too many books already there's too many books <laughs> there's never enough books is there? Uh, i'm not sure there's far too many books <laughs> it's really hard work writing books because they because they well i'm a perfectionist when it comes to the written word that goes out i'm not a perfectionist in life but i think we think it's really important to get it right so yeah, I don't know. I can't think what subject I could possibly write about that hasn't already been written in great detail. But if anybody's got any ideas, OK, <laughs> I'm always up for a challenge. I think life experience is usually something good, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> not enough homeopaths write about their experiences. Do they not? Most of them write about remedies okay. or, um, you know, uh, uh, cases and, and so forth. cases. Mm, yes, but writing it, about yourself as a as a not as a biography necessarily, but you know something along those lines where um, you can just share your experiences of healing without the cases, but just say that uh, this, you know here we are. This is being involved with, for example, uh, the uh, children of Chernobyl, and this led to this, and that led to this, and the importance of education, and so, it's something different. <laughs> I'm just giving you ideas. I don't even know if they're. If they're sensible here. But... I don't know. I don't know. Well, there you go. Live on air. You've got some ideas. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's really, really fabulous. <laughs> that, I think that means a no, actually. I think. <laughs> no, I do. I really enjoy writing. I do write like quite a lot of articles, actually, ghost written articles. So you wouldn't know that I'd written them. Um, and I and I do enjoy writing. So, yeah, it's just it's just about not another book. It would be the thing that would stop me. Yeah. Do you have uh, a favourite remedy or remedies? I have, yeah. Well, it's tricky, isn't it? It's a bit like, what's your favourite piece of music? I think Status mm. Agria has been has been astounding for many people. Um, I I I love Ignatia. I think it is amazing, um, and I think quite often people ignore it for Nat Muir. Um, I'm very keen on the work of Russell Malcolm, who has written and explored extensively the Balnozodes. I think they're absolutely astounding. Um, Folliculinum, an amazing remedy. I've done quite a lot of work with fertility with with success, which has been very lovely in the right place. Mm. Um, yes. I could go on. I, I, I rate Ignatia. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. It's it's so underrated, and yet it's it, yes. so important. It's I so find profound. that. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, you know, I found that uh, I, I, somebody was on the show a few weeks ago, and they were saying, oh, Ignatia, and, you know, it's a female remedy oh, no, in not. the majority of the times. But I, I've never found that uh, no. like that. It's, it's a remedy, and I find that yeah. for emotional conditions, it's absolutely brilliant, yeah. isn't it? Well, I think for anyone who's actually tuned in and very sensitive to any changes, it's also hugely important. Yes, I, I sort of bristle. I am quite um, fierce, apparently, I'm told, um, because I do quite a lot of supervision as well. I'm quite fierce because I don't like it when people say, actually, that's a particularly feminine remedy. It's just not. It's just mm. not the case. Yeah. It's it's for anybody who's got that sensitivity. But I don't know. I mean, there are some remedies like stifolinum that I've hardly ever, ever prescribed. So it could be that I'm sort of stuck in a kind of emotional soup of, I don't know, sensitivity. <laughs> and, that, and that's what I attract. <laughs> I mean, I like teaching medical science, but actually I really I really love teaching homeopathy and I really mm. love when I'm supervising students through their clinical cases because there's so much to explore and to see them blossoming is actually even more for me wonderful than mm. seeing people complete the medical science courses kicking and screaming. <laughs> it's been fascinating talking to you Elaine. Um, oh thank you. So I do hope um, that later this year 
certainly that you will come back on the podcast and we mm. can talk a little bit more yes. um, about uh, your experiences and your insights. But uh, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been delightful and insightful. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Surprising. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will indeed speak to you very, very soon. Lovely. Thank okay. You so yes. No. And good luck to everybody out there in the world. Keep up the good work. Thank you. I do hope you've enjoyed the Homeopathy Health Show here on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. Tune in next time for more things homeopathy, interviews, and segments on the healing possibilities that homeopathy can bring you. And don't forget to visit UK Health Radio online at www.ukhealthradio.com to see the many other amazing shows available to listen live and on demand. Or why not download the app from the iOS and Android stores. Until next time, stay safe and take care.